right, I will be quick as I can. Thank you everyone for sticking around. Uh, I am John Murphy. I've been involved in Monero for about 10 years, a little over 10 years now, so basically since the beginning. Um, and I've been involved in the open source movement or world slightly longer than that. I started to get interested in Python and uh, New Octave, which is like a MATLAB alternative, um, and Linux as well when I was in grad school in about 2011, 2012. I'm now a professor at Cecil College, um, where I teach engineering. Um, so I, I give lots of talks, but this is my first time speaking at a cryptocurrency conference. Um, I'm very honored to be here with you Monero folks and non-Monero folks in the audience. Um, and I'm sure all of you guys have some ideas about what does free and open source software mean, and maybe some of the history that entails as well. But I'm going to give you, hopefully, a little bit of new information here at least. Um, so what is this term FOSS and where did it come from? This is like the 40,000 foot view. Um, there was kind of this pre-era where whenever you bought a computer, they would give you all of the software and the code for that software with the computer and you were kind of free to tinker as you wished. Um, and then in the 1980s, which you may know is around the time when companies like Microsoft and Apple started to grow, uh, Richard Stallman, who I'm sure probably most of the people in the audience are familiar with his name, kind of began his crusade in this free software movement. And it's a kind of interesting story how I got started, but I'm going to move on and go quickly over this whole overview. Uh, but Richard Stallman is you could call him an, ex an extremist. Like he is, is more like Amir Taki, I guess, in the cryptocurrency world. And then later in the 1990s, we had this kind of group of more, you know, friendly business people who wanted to, you know, bring free software to the normies and they were going to call it open source instead. And this, it was, the term was coined by this woman, Christine Peterson, who has a degree in chemistry from MIT. But she really seems to have kind of made a career for herself basically giving TED Talks. Um, but it was a group of people kind of with her. John Mad Dog Hall is a guy who worked at Silicon Valley Graphics, all the way back to Bell Labs. He's been around since the 60s. Uh, Larry Augustine is a VC guy. Um, as, so he's you know one of those business people who wanted to make it more approachable. And then Eric Raymond and Bruce Perrin are co-founders of the Open Source Initiative, as well as um, Eric Raymond wrote a book called The, Cath the Cathedral and the Bazaar. Um, and that's his picture there on the bottom right, and a quote from him, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. So they were, that was kind of, there's, there's kind of three periods, four periods, I'm going to kind of go over here. We have this public domain era where you got all of the software with your computer and you were free to tinker. And then there was, from about 1980 until 1990, I would say is kind of the Stallman era where this term free software came into use. Um, and then between 1990 and 2000, we have Linux, you know, the, the birth of Linux, as well as several big battles with the government and Microsoft. Um, the, and as well as the coining of this term open source. And then from about 2000 on, maybe 2010, um, people started to use this term FOSS. At this point now, the entire internet runs on open source software. IBM bought Red Hat for almost $50 billion, which is an indication of you know, how valuable these open source companies have become. And almost every company in the world uses open source software, whether they know it or not. Um, so, starting with uh, Stallman, he was he graduated from Harvard with a degree in physics, but he was very interested in computers. So he went to MIT and joined the AI lab. Which imagine that they had an AI lab in like 1978 at MIT, um, and he got really aggravated. Um, one of the stories that, like, why did Richard Stallman wrote a manifesto, as well as the new 
tool chain and the licenses that, that surround it. And in this manifesto, he defined four freedoms that users of software should have. Um, and, and he did this as a response to several things, one of which was the 1976 Copyright Act, which codified the rights of copyright holders that only copyright holders could produce, modify, distribute, et cetera. And it extended that copyright to be at least 80 years or so. Um, and actually, one of the stories about why he got so upset was his lab at MIT replaced their LPX printer with a Xerox printer. And on the old printer, they gave him the firmware, and he was able to modify it to like send a message to users when their print job was done, or notify all users the printer was down. And Xerox was like, no, you can't have it. So, you know, that was like it. It's like, we wouldn't all be sitting here if it wasn't for Xerox telling Richard Stallman to go fuck himself, you know, 40 years ago. Um, but he defined in his manifesto these four freedoms that you should be able to run the program as you wish, study how it works, so you need to be able to see the source code, right, and redistribute, as well as redistribute modified copies of uh, the software. And just to emphasize, free software does not mean free as in beer. It generally is free as in beer, but it means free as in freedom, um, not as in price. So, Stallman is working on this new tool set all through the 80s. Uh, there's a project called Minix, which is a predecessor to Linux. Uh, was released in 87, which used the new tool chain. Um, and then Linus Torvalds released the Linux kernel in 1991. Um, and he used that new tool chain that, so he was building on other people's work, right? That's kind of a foundation of open source software is you, you can reuse everyone else's work. Um, and he, you know, he stated that if the new kernel was around, he would not have attempted this. And there's a funny uh, used net or, or message group message here from uh, Linus. I just like that first sentence. I'm doing a free operating system. Just a hobby, won't be anything big and professional, you know. <laughs> and now it's like the whole internet runs on it, right? So, and this, you know, movement has resulted in, you know, figures leading large organizations like this guy is the CEO of Linux, basically, right? I mean, he's the benevolent dictator for life or whatever you want to call him, but you don't see the CEO of IBM communicating with the CEO of NVIDIA like this, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it produces a different uh, type of you know, behaviors, uh, which he discusses there in the bottom right, and I think is um, behavior, no, it's a, it's a work environment that many of us appreciate more than the corporate lifestyle, I guess. So where did this term open source software come from? In the 90s, as I said, you know, Stallman is a pretty polarizing figure. He believes that open source software is a moral issue. Um, not that it's, he also believes that it's a more efficient approach to development, but I mean, he treats it as a, you know, existential <laughs> issue almost. And so there's this group of people in Silicon Valley and they're like, you know, this guy's a little, and we want to like bring Linux to more people. So around the time that they released the source code to Netscape Navigator, they had this you know, meeting where Christine coined the term, and then Linus and uh, Tim O'Reilly, who you guys know, I'm sure, from his books, decided to kind of help promulgate and endorse this term. And so that was the kind of start of open source. So a couple important junctures real quick. Um, the early 1990s involved a lot of open source cryptography software uh, that the government was treating as munitions. The United States government still treats cryptography as munitions, I believe, for the source code of like a certain programs that DOE uses. Um, but this was for you know encryption, PGP. This involved guys like Halfini, Phil Zimmer, 
Uh, it was ultimately Daniel Bernstein who went to the Supreme Court over these issues. But again, you can see this attitude kind of confrontational, not, you know, political attitude. And it's the same kind of attitude that we saw on stage from Amir earlier. Um, and I think that this kind of attitude was somewhat, you know, people felt like, yeah, we should behave like this because we see behavior from Microsoft over the course of a decade to try and, you know, bully Linux companies like Red Hat out of business. So Microsoft bought up some patents and then tried to like scare Linux companies from, from using open source technology and put them out of business. Um, and you can see how things have turned around for them because now they include Linux in Windows. And, uh, um, ex yeah, that as well. Um, so, uh, there we go. So, important modern examples of FOSS. I'm not gonna, I've already talked about the internet. Android, honestly, it doesn't really count anymore, and we're all familiar with Bitcoin, I'm sure. Um, so, licensing is very important in open source projects. And I talked about, you know, the 1976 copyright law, and Stallman came up with this term copy left, which is about giving users of the software right or the product rights. And there's kind of three strong categories, I would say, that you should know about. There's the permissive ones like MIT. This includes all cryptocurrency projects. Um, weekly protective is LGPL. That's the lesser GPL license. It's used by Linux. It allows you to use that code as long as you only dynamically link it, I believe, in your project without your project becoming infected by the GPL license. And so the strongly protective GPL licenses mean if you include that code in your project, then you have to basically license your project GPL and give your users all of the same rights from the code that you are reusing. So there's a funny uh, flow chart over here, which is too small to read, but if we blow up that center part, what should users do? Acknowledge my work? Then you should use something permissive over there. You pay me, there's, you know, commercial licenses. Or digest, adopt, and obey the tenants of free software, right? That's Richard Stallman, GPL, LGPL, and AGPL, a Faro GPL, is a license which I think if you run someone's code on your server and modify it, you're obliged to share that code <laughs> with everyone somehow. Um, so, yeah, cryptocurrency, though, is generally in that permissive category. Uh, this type of licensing, or copyleft, has been extended to other, you know, mediums besides software. So, it's, if, you, if you're dealing in artwork, it's more common to come across these Creative Commons licenses. Uh, but they're somewhat intermingleable with the um, ones on the previous slide. So here's a real quick, that's the MIT license from the Bitcoin project in its entirety on the left. And that, you know, long column is the entire GPL version 2. Version 3 is even longer. So the MIT license is very simple and easy to understand just says you have to acknowledge my work if you use this code, right? GPL version two, you can see up front, it's very political. They're talking about freedoms. And so, I mean, that you can see where that kind of, when it was only Richard Stallman pushing this movement, why maybe there were some people who were like, we need to kind of mainstream this a little bit more. Um, so how to make good FOSS. This is from Eric Raymond's book. Um, there's a lot of stuff in here that is very jargony, like numbers 16 and 17. I don't have any idea what that means, honestly, <laughs> but uh, I think these are the important points here. You know, you get feedback constantly because you're constantly releasing code to your users who are, tend to be also co-developers. Uh, this model has demonstrated that it works for operating systems, 
web servers, cryptography, cryptocurrencies, right? It's really been demonstrated as, as a new way to produce public goods, really, right? I mean, these are non-commercial public goods. So how does Monero fit into this FOSS universe? Um, well, we can start with the birth of Monero, right? It was forked from Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin was a giant scam, but it was licensed, MIT licensed, so anyone could fork it. Um, and I downloaded the source code and I listed the git commits in reverse order for Monero. And so there you can see at the top the very first commit shared by Bitcoin and Monero still. Um, and if we cat, cat is a, a new tool. Uh, <laughs> if we cat the license file, and we see that same MIT license file that was used in Bitcoin, right? Um, and if we cat the readme, there's a little Easter egg. That was the original readme for the, you know, typically where you have some install or maybe like what the project's about. <laughs> You're just like, that's it, <laughs> fresh and juicy. Um, so another important contribution of the open source community to Monero, I would say, is in the mining ecosystem for Monero, which got off to a really, really bad start. Um, because Bitcoin was a scam, it was released with an intentionally crippled miner uh, built into the software. And so you can look up these articles from that August 2014 one is from a professor at Carnegie Mellon who claims he had over 50% of the network hash rate using AWS um, and his own custom closed source miner, right? And for a long time, this guy Claymore, um, he's a GPU miner developer, released a closed source miner with a 1% tax, and he was probably collecting 1% of the Monero for a long time because everybody used his miner, right? But we have some redemption. And there was also an ASIC released by Bitmain, which, re which resulted in Random X, which is kind of the redemption arc here. So as a result of all these closed source shenanigans and some other stuff as well, we ended up with Random X um, by a developer, Tevador. And we've kind of reached a nice open source miner with XMRig, um, XMRig Proxy, and P2Pool, which are primarily all developed by SEC1. Um, so those, you can see in the commits, they're about five years and seven years old. And then giving back to the broader FOSS community, um, this same uh, proof of work, or, or a derivative of this random X proof of work, is now used in the Tor network, another open source kind of public good uh, software, where it's used as a DDoS prevention mechanism. Um, and I, I highlighted this because, or I picked this screenshot because of the quote from Trump down at the bottom there. I just appreciate Trump's uh, pedanticism on the topic there of what is a what is a proof of work algorithm and what is a hash function um, but yeah I mean just to show one more like how long does this take because if we go back oh what is what's the first rule first two rules every good work of software starts by scratching a developer's personal itch, right? This guy Tevador loved working, well, I don't know why, but he loved working on this uh, proof of work algorithm. You know, you can see he spent five years here on RandomX itself, and you can see he's communicating with the tour developers in 2020, and it's finally added to the network just last year. So he's dedicated years of his life uh, to contributing to Monero as well as tour now. Um, for whatever reason he's interested in, I mean, who knows, maybe Tevador is like reliant on darknet markets for his other business and he needs Monero to exist. I don't know, but <laughs> why he does it, you know, you don't need to know why these people are interested. People are interested in things and um, 
it tends to work out well. So how to make bad FOSS, you can follow me on GitHub. <laughs> and I will, I will try and answer any questions you guys have, and thank you for listening.